everyone. Welcome to my talk. I'm Rupa Dasher, CEO and founder of Thrive Wise. The Wise stands for Women in Science and Engineering. We are a tiny charitable nonprofit based in the US, and we focus on retaining women engineers and technical PMs in the industry who are working full time and dropping out. We used to be called Code Chicks. Uh, you might know that name. I rebranded to ThriveWise in 2020 so that we have a broader umbrella for our programs and can now include women in science. This is a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of things, so we'll go pretty quickly through the slides so that we have enough time at the end for questions. Right, really busy slide to just capture what's happened over the last 12 to 13 years uh, and the trajectory of Code Chicks to ThriveWise. Um, so a little bit about my background. Uh, I was in a software developer for 27 years, covering telecom, datacom, mobile apps, virtualization, e-commerce, uh, a whole bunch of other things, uh, a bunch of multinational companies, and a lot of startups. Uh, Through all my career, I was doing reasonably well until the late 2000s when I ran into the usual problem of not getting promoted, uh, not getting traction in my career, not getting visibility, etc. So I desperately looked around for some help and looked at Anita Borg Institute, Great Topper, IEEE, SWE, ACM did the whole thing and nobody could help me and nobody wanted to even talk about you know, women that are actually working. They only wanted to talk about like research or senior leadership or students, that's it. So that kind of forced me to start my own thing, which is, which is what Code Chicks was. And that's how I started back in 2009 uh, as my side gig, <laughs> which kind of grew into something else. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why I do what I do and why I quit my very, very lucrative job with lots of benefits, et cetera, et cetera to just go, on a, go off on a tangent and do this full time. So in 2018, I took this class at UC Berkeley. And at the end of the class, the professor pulled me aside and said, Rupa, you need to rethink your life. <laughs> at which point my jaw dropped. And I was like, what, really? Uh, and she said, what you're doing for your day job, they can find someone else to do. What you're doing with code chicks on the side, only you can do. So you figure out what impact you want to make with your life um, and go that route. So I was, needless to say, pretty shocked. And I kind of blew her off. This is the first time in my life I was actually getting paid a hell of a lot of money and you know, uh, doing pretty visible stuff. You know, I was running all of the backend infrastructure for Walmart.com, which is globally. So a uh, lot of uh, responsibility and visibility. So like, yeah, whatever, OK. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm driving to work. Now, this is the Bay Area, so you know, a one-way commute is one and a half hours. So three hours commuting back and forth to work. I'm sitting on the parking lot you know, of the highway on 85, and I'm listening to NPR, which is what I usually listen to. And there's this program where this guy was saying um, something about you know, what to do with your life or something. I forget what the topic was, but he said, Just think that you got hit by a bus. Supposing you got hit by a bus or a truck and you're lying on the ground, you're lying on the road, you're bleeding. You know you're gonna die. What is your number one regret? And I was, I sat, I was sitting in my car, I was like, huh, I never thought about that. <laughs> and so, anyway, long story short, I was like, you know what? I never really gave Code Chicks a full shot. Like my full time, dedicated you know, um, approach and, and just everything I could, like a, like a commitment. And well, two days later, I looked at my finances and said, you know what, I'm going to tighten my belt six to eight months and drain my savings. <laughs> I have no health insurance, blah, blah, blah. You know, if you're in the US, you know what that means. Um, and I quit my job in end of 2018 and went full time January 1st, 2019 on my nonprofit with no pay, no benefits, no nothing, and just trying to get it off the ground. And knock on wood, I'm still at it. <laughs> we have grown, but COVID hit, so that was kind of 
awful. But hopefully we're going to crawl out of the depths uh, in the next few years if the recession doesn't get too bad. And then we'll see if we can actually make some progress. So anyway, that's, that's my story of why I quit my job and you know, started doing this full time. So let's talk a little bit about the problem we're trying to address at ThriveWise. Some of you may have seen this. Uh, this is a rather old study, 2008. Um, the newer studies, uh, which I haven't actually had a chance to look at, uh, claim that the dropout rate is higher than 56% at this point. So at that time, it was 56% of women in technology left the industry. Um, my gut feel is right now with COVID and everything, it's well over 70%. Some other statistics, the rate of dropout, it's double that of the dropout rate for men, uh, which is pretty hideous because the hiring rate for women is a, is a lot lower than the hiring rate for men. <laughs> so it's called a leaky pipeline. If you don't hire too many and whatever you've got is leaving, right? So it's not a good situation. So that's the problem I'm trying to address with ThriveWise with a variety of programs, which I'm gonna go over. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done in the last 10 years to address like the mentorship aspect, um, specifically on the technical side of things, because that's what we've done a lot of. Uh, the first thing, almost 10 years ago, <laughs> was my first technical talk with a live demo on stage with seven pieces of hardware and a very unreliable Wi-Fi connection at PyCon USA in 2013. Uh, that's when I unveiled my first version of the Pi doorbell, where I did a demo of home automation that I had built on the first Raspberry Pi. This is well before James, who like created the ring doorbell. This is well before he did anything with the ring doorbell. Um, one funny thing was that all the PyCon organizers at that time thought that I was a guy until I showed up. <laughs> you should have seen their faces. <laughs> Anyway, I got to meet Ibn Upton because he was the keynote speaker that, that year. Uh, and people just couldn't believe that a girl could, you know, uh, do a hardcore project like that and do a live demo on stage at PyCon USA. So anyway, that was kind of cool. That same year, we also did our first international competition, uh, all-woman team. Uh, this was a competition that was run by the Open Networking Foundation um, to build an SDN controller using OpenFlow. SDN stands for Software Defined Networking, uh, using OpenFlow, which is an open source standard. Um, so anyway, four months, nights and weekends, because all of us had full-time jobs. <laughs> like we were doing this nights and weekends. Uh, 10,000 lines of C code, full test harness, full functional test harness, um, and a Raspberry port. Uh, we submitted all of that on time um, and uh, I do want to mention we had some legal issues because one of the companies that the engineer, uh, that one of our engineers worked at came back and said, said that she couldn't work on this project even though it was open source. And prominently on their website it says, we are staunch supporters of open source and they wouldn't let her work on an open source project. So anyway, I had to pull some serious strings uh, and uh, you know, finally going through some legal hoops and you know, I had to actually threaten them. <laughs> like, if you don't let her work, I'm gonna make this really, really, really public. Like, and you're gonna look really bad. So anyway, eventually they said, okay, she can work on it for the next two months. And you have to have like a Apache MIT license. I was like, no problem, I can do that. That's what we usually do. Um, so anyway, thank you, Cisco. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so submitted, we were placed eighth in the world. We didn't win the grand prize of 50K, which would have been a lot of money, but we were eighth in the world, not, not too bad. The following year, we did a hands-on workshop, once again at PyCon. This was uh, PyCon Canada at, in Montreal. So um, I bought, configured, and shipped all the hardware for 60 students from San Jose, California to Montreal. I was hoping that the customs people wouldn't block it, and they didn't, thank God, it worked out. We had 75 students show up. We ran out of hardware kits, and we ran out of seats. The workshop went supremely well. 
and we were the only all-woman team to run a hardware and software hands-on workshop at PyCon ever. So that was a good, good thing to do. Uh, 2012, almost 10 years ago, was uh, a talk that I did with Christina and Shuki, who were both at Google at that point, uh, on lessons learned from all of us on the technical ladder and some tips and tricks. We had like 300 attendees show up. They had to close the doors because there was some fire hazard or something. Um, but yeah, that was, that was uh, the first time that we spoke at Grace Hopper. Since then, we've spoken three or four times at Grace Hopper. Uh, some other things that we've done, some Arduino workshops, OpenShift workshops, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we only do open source, uh, which is why I'm here. Um, no closed source proprietary stuff. One other thing I want to talk about is our flagship program, which is a partnership with SRI International, which is a premier inter uh, institution with very, very deep technical roots. And SRI is Stanford Research Institute, in case you don't know. So we partnered with them in 2019 to run a pilot program to pair our members with senior researchers and open source projects that are hosted by SRI. Uh, it was a pilot. Nobody had ever done it before. Nobody knew how to do it, so we got to give it a shot. And so we had five participants, uh, five months, um, with in-between results. <laughs> uh, because it's very hard to have free time, or free, quote unquote, free time after your full-time job to be doing something like this. Um, it was all C and assembly based, so low level coding. Uh, the program is now on hold due to a lack of resources. Also, COVID just decimated us. So, uh, But that that is a program I'm hoping to start back up uh, once we have a little bit of uh, funding and resources. All right, let's talk about the data because that's what I came here to share. Um, before I share this, I want to say this is data that I gathered um, in 2019 from a survey at our in-person conference. That was our last in-person conference before COVID hit. Uh, I've taken snapshots of the surveys with the questions and the responses. Um, and I want to just remind people that the audience is primarily technical women developers and technical PMs who work in the industry. So first question, how much do you know about open source? 64% use it. They don't know much about contribution. They don't know anything about contribution. They don't understand anything about open source communities, practices, or culture, or guidelines, nothing. They just know how to use it. They know how to clone it. They know how to you know, include it in whatever they're building, and that's about it, which was very interesting. How interested are you in learning about and contributing to open source? This is surprising, 80%, and probably more than 80%, um, are very interested in learning more. Uh, a lot of people want to become contributors. There's a significant portion, like 12%, want to actually become maintainers. I'm not sure they understand what maintainer is or, or means, but they still want to do it. Um, and so this is, so there's definitely very high interest from the community in doing it. It's just, you know, they have no idea what to do or how to, how to go about it. Which open source contribution methods are you interested in? So I wanted to understand, like, this is my question to understand, like, the altruistic aspect of, of people. Like, do they, do they want to be uh, contributing in a, in a uh, you know, I don't want money kind of way, or you know, they want to get paid for it? Greater than 60%, very high interest in projects that are hosted by reputable nonprofits and educational institutions, which is they don't get paid for this. And there's actually low interest in any projects that are uh, hosted by a for-profit company where you get paid to do this. And this was very surprising. I think if I did this, if I asked this question to the male crowd, it would be a flip <laughs> because I think everybody wants to get paid to do this. But the women, uh, have, a, have a much more altruistic um, um, interest um, in this. How many years have you worked in the industry? So this is some demographics that I wanted to share. This is 2019 pre-COVID. Largely what I call junior developers, you know, zero to about six, seven years of experience. It's some senior dev profiles. Um, 
I do want to add, like since 2020, since COVID, we've gone virtual with our conferences and I see a big uptick in the 20, 10 to 20 years of experience range and a lot of international attendees. So that's been kind of interesting. I'm hoping I can run the survey uh, next year again uh, at our virtual conference and see what the difference is uh, and what COVID did uh, to all of us. I wanted to throw this in because <laughs> this is such a big problem. Uh, what is the biggest reason you might leave the tech industry? Number one reason, bar none, bad managers. And number two, high stress. Everybody has stress, I mean the men also have stress. But the bad management is like a, is an overwhelming issue. Uh, once again, this is pre-COVID. Uh, if you look at the options that, that I asked for, uh, there's one, there's one choice that says no support at home with kids and house chores. And my, I suspect if I ran this again in like next year, this particular choice would be either number one or number two, uh, because that has been hugely problematic uh, with, with COVID and everybody working from home. So why is this happening? <coughs> As I mentioned, this is a funny slide to kind of nail home the point that you know, managers can be really bad. Um, are you training your managers adequately to handle the current and next generation workforce? That's a, that's a question to ask, especially for the companies. Getting promoted is almost impossible, or it seems almost impossible. Uh, nobody really knows how to do that, and every company is different, and even within companies, you know, different BUs, the business units, and teams are different. So. Uh, you know, is there a measurement being done on a regular basis to gauge effectiveness of the current policies in place? That's a question to ask. Everybody knows this, pay inequity and transparency. Can we have a little less of the echo? Thank you. So most companies are making good progress on this and there's currently an effort to provide much more guidance to all all, all employees on pay structure and expectation of performance and stuff, but we're still not there. And I just wanted to highlight, you know, with the pay difference, when women retire, you have a minimum of 70K less in retirement, probably a heck of a lot more. And the other aspect is, as, as we all age, women have you know, more expensive health care you know, healthcare issues than the men do. So on the one hand, you have low finances for retirement, and then you have high expenses uh, on the healthcare side. So, so it's a double whammy. This one is the hardest to address, especially for you know, um, Asian and South Asian uh, demographics, uh, which is a lot of our membership. Um, we are all a product of the society that we grew up in, and uh, Asian societies have some very, very serious issues uh, with cultural expectations. Uh, there, we had a talk yesterday uh, from VMware on um, open source in Asia. I forget what her name was, but she did a really good talk. She was Japanese. Uh, but yeah, and I agreed with totally with her. You know, the, the expectations for you know parenting for. Uh, not being very prominent in order to keep the ego balance and power power balance at work, you know, to work, you know, all of that shows up in a big, big way, a uh, big negative way for the women, actually. So we have fingers pointed at us from every direction. Uh, in particular, studies have shown that women are more critical of other women than men are. So that was kind of an eye-opening uh, study that happened. So this brings me to what we do at ThriveWise. Um, so we are uniquely focused on retaining the women who are already working. Uh, yeah, we do a little bit of recruiting, but mostly it's retention. And we base our methodology on the practices followed by open source communities, which has existed for many dec decades. Our primary community is women engineers, women PMs and allies, both men and women. And by PM, I mean product program and project managers. 
typically on the technical ladder when you know when the women get really frustrated because <laughs> they can't get promoted or get the right projects we see a shift from the technical ladder to the pm ladder because that seems to be the only way to to kind of progress and still stay in the tech industry so this is why i expanded it to not just the technical ladder but also the pm ladder is because uh, most of the women on the pm ladder are very very technical they all come from engineering backgrounds uh, and the women plus means anyone who identifies as a woman, regardless of their gender journey. So any LGBTQIA plus, uh, we've always had um, had awesome uh, members from, from that community since day one. So uh, we don't even think twice about it. A quick run through of our, of our pillars and our programs. So we have three pillars, education, mentorship and sponsorship, and advocacy. And I've tried to highlight some of the programs that are tied to each of the pillars in those, in those rectangular boxes. The ones that are bolded are the ones that I'm still running, uh, all virtually. Um, the ones that are not bolded are on hold because of resource issues and mainly funding. Um, so uh, I want to highlight that we have our microconference coming up in a week and a half, September 27th to 29th. Uh, I, will, I will show you uh, the link to to click on to register for it. It's all virtual. So uh, please do join us uh, uh, We have keynotes we have hands-on workshops and panel sessions and This time I'm adding a leadership track with very senior leaders uh, Doing keynotes to tell us what they actually do One thing I want to highlight is the allyship aspect especially at one of these conferences, like LF conferences, where it's mostly men. Um, having good male allies is critical for us to retain the women that are already here. And there are a lot of men that want to help, that are interested in helping, and have no idea what to do. Or they Google something, and they find something easy to do, and they try it, it backfires, and they give up, and they're like, I'm never doing this again. I don't want to be an ally. So for all those people, we have an allyship training package that we offer to companies and corporations where we will come in and do a, a hands-on workshop with some homework associated with it so that both men and women can learn some of the basics of allyship, what to do, what not to do, how to do it, and how to be consistent um, and so that it becomes a sustainable practice. Um, so, and, and things hopefully will change in the workplace to make it easier for women to thrive and survive and grow. A quick run through of um, some of the feedback on our programs. I don't want to run through all of these right now, but generally we get pretty good ratings for all of our programs, including the conference, the safe space programs that we, that we do at both at the conference and, and the separate program, and the ally training um, uh, workshop that we do, so pretty high ratings. I wanted to recap what works and what doesn't work. Number one thing is psychological safety. A lot of people talk about it, especially now. There have been some research papers on this. It is very easy to talk about. It is very difficult to do. Um, to achieve psychological safety, you have to have a very, very deep connection with the audience. And you have to really understand what helps them, even from their cultural background, what helps them feel psychologically safe. And it can be quite different depending on which country you're from. So um, that is the number one thing. Obviously, mentors and sponsors, uh, people already know about that. Uh, the other thing I want to highlight is the discipline aspect. You know, if everything that you do is not going to be totally easy, so it takes effort, sacrifice, you know, a lot of discipline, have realistic goals, and try to try to meet them. What doesn't work? <laughs> Complaining and not actually doing the work. <laughs> that usually doesn't work. Uh, not having realistic goals is uh, is another aspect because then it just you know you just kind of spin in the same place and not get anywhere. And then expecting practices to be easy and like a silver bullet approach to things. It's like, oh, you know, I'm just going to do this one thing one time and everything will be fine. That's not how it works because this whole space is rooted in behavioral and mindset change. And that in human beings is 
extremely difficult. Um, so it takes a long time and it takes constant work. Um, so, so those are things that, that work and don't work. This is our website, and that's a tiny URL to, to join us. Um, there's a Get Newsletter right here button. Um, we publish our newsletter once a month on the third Thursday of each month. Uh, we've had good feedback on, on the fact that we have some good articles in it. We have technical articles, we have non-technical articles, and I usually do like a state of the org um, spiel uh, at the beginning. So please do join us and sign up to get the newsletter. Uh, there's also a button for the microconference, which is in one and a half weeks, a uh, week after next. So feel free to look at that and, and register for it. Um, we'd love to see you there. And with that, um, may the code be with you. That's our slogan, and I'm Rupa. Uh, I will take questions now. Thank you for coming. Any questions? Any feedback? Oh, yes. I'm wondering if you have any statistics around first time contributors. Sorry. I'm wondering if you have statistics around first time contributors becoming sustainable contributors. Like, how often do they come back and have it be a sustained contribution versus the one offs? So, we did that study uh, like 2015. On 2015, we had 20 to 25 women contributing to various projects. 18 of them dropped out for, for a variety of reasons. Um, I haven't run the study yet, again. Um, at this time, with COVID, it's been extremely difficult to get anybody to do anything. Uh, especially out of their normal like work timings, because now work just overflows into everything, right? Everybody's working from home, and some company cultures are such that you know you will work when I ask you to work, which is 24/7. <laughs> um, so it's very, very difficult for the women to actually carve out time, even if they want to. They really, really want to. They're very interested, but just physically, they're too exhausted with you know family and everything else. So I haven't done that, but even, even pre-COVID, it was not good. Um, there were certain contributors who, like the two that, that survived, <laughs> it was their job to do that. Like the company paid them to do that, which is why they survived. Okay, so, I mean, you see this huge problem um, where if the company is sponsoring and paying for you to do that, it is somewhat doable and sustainable. If they don't, it's like impossible. It's impossible, yeah. Good question, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you again for the great talk and yeah, <laughs> loved learning more about uh, ThriveWise. So my question was more, you picked up a bit on the region, on the Asian region, but do you have in, as part of the survey kind of more reflections or trends from across the globe? So let's say kind of Africa or Europe or any differences I'll be interested to hear. So the survey was 2019. It was an in-person conference in the Bay Area. Okay. So it was a very <laughs> local crowd <laughs> that showed up and it's very South Asian. Okay. I would love to have participation mostly from EU and Africa. Like we have like zero footprint in Africa. I would love to have like some footprint in Africa and see what what's happening there. Okay, because that's that's like a that's like a huge undiscovered territory, right? Um, and I'm hoping you know that with the virtual, you know, all all conferences are virtual right now. We've seen huge traction from India, from Australia, New Zealand, from Brazil from uh, parts of the EU, actually, Germany, uh, UK. Nothing from Africa, nothing from India. Okay, so, so that's, that's what I've seen so far. But I'm, I'm trying to see how to tap into, like, Africa, for instance. You know, that's like, I have no connection. But if you can help me with that, that would be awesome. Because <laughs> I, I would love to run this survey, like, either, probably, like, next, our next conference is April, not another one in September for next year. 
I would love to do the survey in April of next year and see what has changed and what the demographics look like um, at this point. I don't have any direct. I was thinking some of our developers in our team, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap, they're based in East Africa. But at this ah. conference, I've heard of OSCA, Open Source Community Africa, or She Codes Africa oh. as a network that okay. might be useful to connect. Oh, I will try to connect with <laughs> them. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Going once, going twice, gone. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. <laughs>